Hello everyone, uh, welcome to homework day uh, for chapters 8, 9, and 10. Um, so the main agenda we've got for today is to review homework problems that you've been working on and see what questions have popped up and, and what we could answer. But um, I was looking on the grade book and as of this moment right now, I just refreshed the page, no one has submitted their homework for chapters 8, 9, and 10 yet. So, uh, and I, I heard from a couple people in chat here today, but um, most people I haven't heard from, so maybe I should assume the worst and assume <laughs> that um, not many people have worked on this um, or are very far along with it. Um, I did, uh, I mean, I don't want to get all like, uh, shame, shame, shame or something like that, but, um, you know, I, I was warning at the start of this unit that this is a big homework assignment. And so I was giving the advice of like trying to do problems as we moved through the material. So after we got through one of the chapters, maybe do the homework from that chapter and get to the next one and that and so on and so forth. Um, but if, if you're in a place where that didn't happen, um, I think it's still worth uh, recognizing or just having a heads up here if you haven't even started it that this is going to take a lot of work. This homework assignment is not a quick or easy one. Um, and it will take time, and it'll take time to do it right um, and to get really good practice with it. If you are really um, hamstrung on your like bandwidth and time and effort this week in getting ready for the exam, probably the best advice I can give um, is to try to do at least some of all of the exercises um, like start with with doing a few problems maybe not doing all of them from one exercise list um, but doing some of them and doing them really in depth especially for for this 8 9 10 stuff um, because as I as I've indicated before when it comes to the exam the exam sections that concern inductive arguments are all about your explanations the explanations of your analysis and not just the conclusion that you come to I will not be grading based on just you say it's doing good on this standard or doing bad on this standard I will have to I have to look at your explanation to be able to see if you really understand the criteria of analysis that we're using to evaluate those arguments so the, the devil's in the details here. It, it's in the, the reasoning that you're using to apply that standard to come to that evaluation that is the real place of evaluation. So in doing the homework problems, explaining your answers is really key. Um, and when we've had some exercises from past units that have required explanation, like say the conversational implications section back from chapter two, I remember seeing that homework, like when I was just checking people off for it, oftentimes those explanation answers were pretty thin and that is definitely a danger to have on the radar here if I get really thin answers on the exam I just won't be able to give you a lot of partial credit um, I was talking to I think people during the homework lab yesterday about this a lot more and I just wanted to kind of reiterate it for everybody in this in the video here today that when I'm grading this exam you don't start with a hundred percent score and then I ding you that's not how I'm doing it the way I, I grade this exam is you start with zero credit and I'm looking for excuses to give you credit. So you need to give me those excuses. So your explanations, you definitely want to err on the side of maybe too much rather than too little. Give me everything that, you, that you've got to offer in terms of how you're thinking through applying that standard of evaluation. And, and definitely there's, a, there's another side of the boat that you can fall off on in terms of like maybe getting paranoid or or introducing things that really are sort of irrelevant to using that standard but in terms of if you're trying to like game the exam the strategy that says oh I'm gonna hold I'm gonna hold the cards close to the vest so that I don't give Tim reasons to take credit away from me that strategy is gonna backfire every time so I want I want to be really upfront about that so that you all know what the expectations are and just kind of what you're up against, you know, like how how is this going to be evaluated? I want to make that as explicit as possible. So is that is that making sense, people in the chat? The the kind of advice for warning I'm giving right now. Hello. A anyone? Any any questions about about that? Yeah, making sense. Okay. 
does anyone have, have questions about how this is going to go? I, I, like I said, I don't want there to be any guessing game or surprises or something like that. I mean, one of the, the rationales for why I have to do it this way or why this would be the best way for me to handle exams is that every, uh, as you've seen from the lectures, every criteria, almost every criteria that we use for evaluating inductive arguments, you've got the kind of criteria itself defined in principle sort of theoretically, but to apply it to a particular problem is always mediated with your background assumptions. And I can't grade you on that. Like, I can't grade you about your general knowledge of reality um, or that you need to have the exact same background assumptions I do. But if you give your explanation of how you're using, how you're reasoning this out, how you use your background assumptions to connect the dots between this formal or theoretical criteria and the details of the problem that you're analyzing, then even if you have different, if you think differently than I do, then I'll still be able to tell that you're using the technique competently or maybe incompetently right but I, I'll be able to, to recognize that if you if you are using it right that you are using it right even if you come to a different answer than I would do people ever talk themselves out of points uh, what do you what do you mean by that Adrian Like, like someone gives an explanation of their of their reasoning, and um, I don't give them credit for it. I mean that that can happen, if if the reasoning is wrong. <laughs> I mean if there's a misunderstanding about the criteria, then yeah, I can't I I won't be able to give credit for that. You know, it isn't just purely about you wrote some words down, you wrote a bunch of words down in the answer, so I'm going to give you some credit for doing that. Um, it, it, we do. We're, we're striving for accuracy, for competency here. Um, but I, I guess I could put it this way: if you don't give me much, then there, there's no hope. <laughs> if you do give me as much as you got, then maybe I'll be able to find the excuses to give you as much credit as I possibly can. That that might be the way to put it. Or that they ramble, and then you feel that they know less than initially implied as you read along what they wrote. Um, well, one thing that I've seen happen before, I can be honest about here, is that sometimes a student is giving me, like, everything that they remember from the, like, lectures, right? Um, but they're, they're mixing up the standards with each other, so they're kind of using what I call the shotgun method, where they're like, if I put everything out there, all the options, then the right one will be included in it. And that's the kind of thing that I... I can't give, I could probably give some partial credit for that, but not a whole heck of a lot of it. Um, so uh, I was saying in the lecture that in argument for analogy, uh, argument from analogy, I oftentimes see the standards of relevance, importance, and disanalogies kind of all mixed up together. Um, and that, that, won't, that won't fly because part of the competency here is separating out what are the unique considerations of each of those standards. Um, another thing that I'm familiar with from past experience here with, with student answers on the exam is like mixing up all the, the three different forms of bias that we were talking about for statistical generalizations, that those are all getting kind of talked about together because the, the student is like, I kind of know the ideas here, but I don't know which one is which. And so they all kind of get shoved together. Those, those are going to be cases where I usually award some credit. It wouldn't be no credit, um, but it's not going to be a lot of credit. It's, it's all about knowing each standard and what it's trying to get you to look at and to have the language to articulate that, right? And that's why practice with the homework is really crucial. Getting, getting some experience with articulating, being able to put into words, to take the stuff that's going on up here in your head and put it out into words, very, very helpful in preparing you to be able to do well with the exam. And also for recognizing maybe where you are confused. Like when you take a stab at doing that articulation and you're like, oh, wait, am I talking about this standard or is that part of this other standard? I, I can't remember. Once you've taken a stab at it and, and encountered that, that you're sort of um, maybe insecurity about your, how much you've got 
the different standards kind of cleanly defined from each other, then you've got the opportunity to ask me a question. Now you know something to ask me about, to get clarification about, and for us to clean up and recalibrate. Yeah. Um, I, I like that we're um, spending time talking about this in sort of the bigger picture approach to it. Uh, I feel like that's relevant, especially if a lot of people have not done the homework yet um, <clears throat> or don't have as much that they've uh, worked on with the homework yet. Um, so if there's other questions that are kind of on this level, I'd love to answer them for you today, um, So maybe, like right now. Um, does anyone else have other kinds of concerns? Or maybe if, if you were starting the homework but not feeling like you were capable of getting some productive work done on it, um, what was holding you up? What kind of barriers there were? What what can I do? How can I help? Oh, uh, while you're typing stuff in there to the chat, um, I just remembered a, an example I wanted to talk about a few minutes back about this whole thing about how we have different background assumptions. Um, I had a student maybe five, six years ago in this class and uh, worked with her a lot. Um, and I actually I asked her uh, if I could use her as an example in future classes, um, if I could talk about her situation, and she said yes. So I have I've consent from to talk about her, um, but she uh, she was autistic, she was on the spectrum, and she was really nervous coming into the class because of this, and she knows um, maybe her uh, she's quite articulate. That was my experience, you know. Um, autism manifests in a lot of different ways and and she but she was she had a lot of ability at being able to have self-awareness of her situation the kind of cognitive difference that she was working with compared with you know most other students that she's had class experiences with so it, it was very obvious to her that she thinks in a different sort of way about stuff that her the paths that her mind travels down, where her intuitions are calibrated, how her imagination functions, is different from other people, and um, and so she was she reached out to me outside of class all the time. We talked a lot um, to try to uh, connect the dots on this stuff, and um, and she did really well. By the end of the quarter, she was actually tutoring other students in the class. Basically, um, she was a, a re very remarkable. Uh, uh, example of someone who, who really succeeded in this class um, but her her case was a perfect demonstration of what I'm talking about about how this class functions and works and how I evaluate your work on the exam that even if you think in a way that's really different than how I do if you're able to articulate and put out there what you're doing then I can see how your use of the rational and logical techniques of analysis that we've got here that you're using it competently even if you come to different results than I do and this is um, awesome because a lot of times even figuring out whether an argument is a good one can be a matter of rational dispute you know we want the arguments to help sort out our rational controversies um, but even when it comes to how much does this argument contribute to that effort we can have rational controversy around that and the same way in which being able to articulate how you're interpreting what people are saying for conversational implication. We're saying like, if there's miscommunication, if you're able to explain how you're, the strategies in speaking that you're using or the strategies in listening and interpreting that you're using, then it's a little easier for people to work out that miscommunication, to get, instead of talking past each other, to connect. Same thing here, that if we think in really different ways, but we're able to kind of train this ability at articulating the reasoning that we're using and how we're deploying these rational principles and standards, then if we don't see eye to eye on something, we can at least recognize what's happening there and maybe productively pursue that disagreement and work towards resolving that. So, um, so I wanted to share her story. I thought uh, that it's a it's a really good demonstration of, of what I'm talking about. And there were many times that her her way of approaching a, a scenario um, that I put together for say an exam problem was um, unique um, and had a, a different a different take on things than the answers I'm used to getting. Um, but she was able to get in most of those cases like really nice full credit answers, um, even though they they weren't maybe what I was thinking or anticipating as an answer when I designed the exam question, for instance. Um, another thing I wanted to note generally in terms of helping you with expectations here, another one just came to mind. Um, again, please 
put if you got more questions on this level, please drop them into the chat here and, and uh, while I'm talking, and I'll I'll answer them for you. Um, you don't have to wait for me to get done here. Um, but uh, one other thing I wanted to offer is, if you have started a lot of the homework problems for eight, nine, and ten, you might have noticed that a lot of exercises really seem to be almost cherry-picked or designed artificially to highlight a particular standard for evaluating that type of argument than all of them. So they're not not all the problems you're like you either have the details of the circumstances or enough information or context to work with where it really makes sense to to have a nice clear straightforward answer for how one of the standards like actually applies to that case. Um, the exam problems are not going to be like that. I, I'm not putting any trick problems in there, and I'm not doing um, these kind of cherry-picked things. I've uh, worked hard and sort of refined over the years um, exam exam problems here that I've designed so that all of the standards there's something to work with there. That there there's a um, if you if you know the principle if you know the standard. Um, then you're going to be able to come up with something. Um, you, you've got the, all the puzzle pieces that you need to work with in order to, to apply that standard meaningfully, productively, that, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, the, the way I, 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 I talked about this with exam one too. The way I design problems is a balancing act between um, I don't want them to just be so straightforward that they just like slap you in the face with the right answer that it's just like superficially transparent I want them to be a little tricky I, I want them to be a little bit more like real-world situations where things aren't always so um, clinical and straightforward um, but I also don't want them to be so tricky that they rely on specialized background knowledge in order to be able to work with like maybe you remember that one of the does the dog need to go for a WALK that example from chapter two, um, you know, that one would require you to have some background knowledge about dog psychology to really sort it out. So I try to avoid that kind of thing. I, I want it to be problems, I, ideally, where if you know theoretically, if you have the, the understanding of the principles that we're using for evaluation, that when you apply them into that case, it might take a little bit of care and thoughtfulness to, to have the answer kind of come out. Um, but it, it'll be there, and that if you know what you're doing, there there is the there's all the clues needed to be able to sort that out, and to and to be able to have confidence with the answer too. I mean, everything in induction is sort of, you know, it's not it's not like doing a math problem where you're like nailed it. Um, you know, you're always love maybe a little bit of second guessing going on. Um, but the problems that I, I have on the exam are really designed to be uh, accessible. That they might take a little bit of a puzzle sol solving to unlock, but that it there it is there, and there's something that's pretty pretty clear, given the details that you've got to work with. Um, with with problems that are written like this on an exam, that are not like just scenarios that are happening in the real world, you know, there's not as much context, um, but you can trust that you've got all the details that you need, keeping in mind that you also bring your background assumptions into the mix. But I'm trying to have problems that um, people are going to have background assumptions about. Um, even if some of you have different assumptions about them, that you'll have something to work with there. And and I've got some examples I can talk about. Andrew, I saw you were like typing and then then weren't typing. Um, is there? Do you have a question? Hmm. I'm struggling to balance study for retake of exam one and prep for exam two. Um, advice is welcome on this. Um, I would say at this stage in the game, the most important thing would be uh, preparing for exam two. Um, that's the one that has a harder deadline to it because I need to be able to grade it uh, as fast as possible. I will, I'm going to try to turn it around within 24 hours. Um, and get the answers out to you so that you can have an opportunity to take um, the makeup for exam two if you want to before the quarter is over. So a week from this Friday, so the following Friday, is the very end of finals week. The makeup exams are open all the way until then. So <clears throat> it might I think the most crucial thing would be prioritizing exam two. That would be my advice.
Um, I, I exam two is open right now. I believe it closes um, Sunday, Sunday night, I think. And then I was going to have it graded Monday. That was my plan. Um, and then you'll have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to do makeups. I think that's what I got here. I can double check it. More, more questions? Any questions? Things I can answer? Give you a clear expectations? Yeah, the exam is due the 15th at midnight, so that's that's Sunday. Oh, someone texted me. I think this is from our class. Um, can I bypass the makeup if I can have more time to do the exam? Oh, um, I don't. I don't know if this is someone who's in the chat. Um, let's see here. I think this is uh, someone who maybe is live here. Uh, so I, I know who this is. Do you want me to not? Um, Answer this uh, live, or do you want to talk talk about it later, or, or can I answer it right now? Um, you can text me your answer. I don't know if there was some special meaning that I got a private text about it versus that it was in the chat here. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> uh, the the exam two deadline is a hard deadline. I I need to have that done Sunday. Um, I can't delay it because I, I want to make sure that people have have some window here to consider doing the makeup for exam two. Um, so if I delay that, if I make extensions for anybody, then um, I won't be able to like send out the answers and that kind of thing. So uh, there's not a trade-off here of abandoning an opportunity to do the makeup in order to get more time for exam two. Uh, we got to stick to that. Okay, um, so um, let me let me kind of pull the room here. Um, how many people uh, you put a vote in here if you've got a preference on it? Um, how many people would like to uh, hear me talk a little bit more about the exam just in general? Um, I've got some other things I can say about um, what kinds of problems will be on the exam. We can do this later this week too. I mean, this whole week is just for exam prep. I've carved out. I, I'm not going to try to throw any informal fallacies material, any new material, into this week. Today, tomorrow, and Friday are all just for exam prep. Do we want to do that today, now? Would that make more sense if people haven't done as much of the homework? Or how many people have, like, I want to talk about some homework problems today? Um, of those two options here, should I spend more time just kind of talking in, in generalities, or should we start looking at some homework problems? How do people want to use our space today? This is your space. Okay. All right. Um, we can do we can do more talk about the um, exam later on this week for sure. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll let some other people get their votes in if they want. So far, it's unanimous in favor of homework. Okie dokie. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to screen share um, the homework exercises and start dropping into the, um, the chat what kind of, uh, which problems you'd like to take a look at.
is it showing up? People able to see uh, the uh, PDF <clears throat> on the video? Mm -hmm, cool. Exercise one. Yes, this is exercise one. So this is just about figuring out whether things are deductive or versus inductive. There will not be a section like this on the exam. But knowing the difference between deduction and induction is, is definitely relevant and important. Um, and uh, I think I ended up talking about this in the lab with people yesterday. Um, <clears throat> we, were, we were reviewing some of these. Um, the main thing that it comes down to is which standard makes sense to apply to the argument to evaluate its support relation. <clears throat> so arguments that are valid, we should definitely hold to the standard of validity. That makes sense to do. If they are valid, why say that they're just strong if they can do better than that? Because validity is a higher uh, standard for, for support relation. And even invalid arguments may be um, appropriately evaluated through validity if they're the kinds of arguments that are aiming at validity, like mathematical arguments or formal logic arguments, things like that. For example, um, well, actually, we don't have any examples here, but um, invalid arguments, uh, it's not like if it's invalid, then it will be inductive or something like that. Um, but the, the arguments that we want to use the inductive standard of strength for are the kinds of arguments that given the type of appeal that they're making, there would just never be any hope in a million years that they ever could be valid. And anything that is <clears throat> reasoning from observational evidence, like it that's empirical, or kind of like scientific reasoning about states of affairs in the world that are contingent, that's never going to be a, a deductively valid argument. That's always going to be something that at best can only hope to be strong. So that's what's going on here. Um, any particular problems from this one that people want to ask about? Or just generally here, what, what exercises would you like to do? Which ones should we take a look at? <clears throat> Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Can't see the screen anymore? Oh, is it working? Number eight. Okay, let's take a look. <clears throat> Oh, so when I when I minimize it, then it then it. Oh, okay, okay, all right. That's good to know. So when I minimize it, it goes back to my video screen, or what's up? I don't know exactly how the screen sharing actually shows up on your end. Oh, it just goes dark. Okay, 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 okay. I see. All right. Um. So here it is. Number eight. Because both of our yards are near rivers in Tennessee, and my yard has lots of mosquitoes, there must also be lots of mosquitoes in your yard. Uh, what kind of argument is this? That, now that we've gone through all, the, all of the, the inductive argument unit, what, what form of reasoning is this? It is not deductive. 
If the premises are true, that doesn't guarantee the truth of the, con the conclusion. This, is, this is an inductive argument, and it's actually one of the inductive argument forms that we've been studying. It's not a generalization. Um, there, there isn't a. The conclusion is not about a general reference class. the The conclusion here is that there are lots of mosquitoes in your yard. So your yard is not a not a, a reference class like a big category of things that includes um, your yard and my yard and that kind of thing. So the conclusion is. There must be a lot of mosquitoes in your yard. And the premises are, my yard is next to a river in Tennessee, and your yard is next to a river in Tennessee, and my yard has lots of mosquitoes. It's not a causal inference either. But I appreciate you throwing some answers out there. <laughs> the chat is pretty, pretty quiet today. Got an idea, Jason? Yeah, argument from analogy, right? So it's saying because our yards are similar in that they're both near rivers in Tennessee, the fact that my yard has mosquitoes is an indicator that your yard is also going to have mosquitoes. There are two cases, the disputed case, the case that the conclusion is about, and the analogous case share some properties, so they're also going to share this property of having lots of mosquitoes in the yard. Um, does that make sense? Uh huh. Yes. Cool. Cool. So, though this is an inductive argument, um, it's definitely based on empirical information um, about observations about the world, and any argument that takes that form is never going to be able to provide the absolute logical guarantee that uh, that deductive validity demands. Um, so because it's hopeless for it ever to be possibly valid, no matter how many similarities we added to this argument to try to give it more support, it's never going to rise to the level of being valid. So it just doesn't make sense to hold it to the standard of validity. But I, I'd actually recommend that we don't spend too much time on exercise one. I think we could much more productively use our time on the other exercises that because those are the ones that are going to much more closely reflect what you're doing on the exam. Um, so evaluating the generalizations here in exercise two. Oh, can we go over one problem from chapter eight, exercise four? Uh, of course, yes, let's do it. So these are the statistical application problems. Which, uh, which problem would you like to take a look at, Dania? Yeah, Two. Okay. So this one says, very few teams repeat as Super Bowl champions. New England was the last Super Bowl champion. Therefore, New England will not repeat as Super Bowl champion. So um, what is the uh, reference class? Yep, that's right. Teams that have won the Super Bowl. And what is the subset? No, actually. The subset will be um, a category of things or, or a thing that is in the reference class that is really the subject of the conclusion when we're talking about a statistical application. So remember, there, there's the bigger category, that's the reference class, and the smaller category, that's the subset. In an application, we're making a claim about the subset on the basis of something that's true about the reference class that it's a part of. Yes, the New England team, that is the subset. And the property in question here would be
repeating as a Super Bowl champion. That would be the like property X here. Okay, so when we're evaluating a statistical application, we've got two standards. We first need to check up on how how strong is the argument based on the percentages or ratios involved um, in the argument and because all applications will have a ratio to them there'll be a, a certain percentage or uh, um, probability of the reference class having the, the claimed feature um, and then the second standard will be about the relevance of the reference class did we choose the most relevant reference class for figuring this out so <clears throat> Let's start with the first one. What's the ratio that we've got in here? What's the percentage? Very few. That's right. That's all we get. And I was saying how you don't always get a number for the percentage. Um, it could just be some informal English that speaks to a ratio. Very few, we can probably infer, um, is you know close to zero percent. It's sort of on that end of the spectrum. Very few. There's some, but not a lot. Um, so is that doing good or bad for this standard of evaluation? Good. That's right. Um, it's good if the ratio, the nearer that it is to zero or a hundred, the better. The closer it is to 50-50, the worse. So very few, if that's like next to none, that, that's probably doing okay. Uh, it'd be nice to have some more precision here, but, you know, that's, that's what we've got to work with. That's what you have to work with. Again, all you need to do in, in your answer is explain your reasoning so that I can tell that you know what this standard is about and what makes something stronger or weaker on that standard. Um, so that would be fine here. Okay, now the tricky one for applications, the, 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 the ratio, the first one is, is pretty straightforward. You know, it just needs to be close to zero or a hundred percent. Um, the second one is the one that's a little, that requires a little bit more critical thinking and creative thinking. So this, this standard asks, is the reference class chosen to get insight about the subset? the most relevant reference class that we could have chosen for figuring out if the subset has the claimed feature. So the conclusion here is about whether New England will repeat as Super Bowl champions or not, and the conclusion is saying that they won't. Um, if we wanted to figure out whether they will repeat or not, um, what do you think about the, the relevance of the reference class, looking at all of the teams that have won the Super Bowl? Do you think that's a, a really good reference class for making this prediction? Is it the most relevant? Why are you thinking that, David? Let, let, let's hear your reasoning. It's all about the the reasoning, so the explanations. Because you would need to look at multiple teams, I would think, who won the Super Bowl. Oh, that's what we're doing. We're, we're looking at all the teams that won the Super Bowl and seeing how frequently do they repeat. Do they win the Super Bowl two times in a row? So if, if that's your thinking, David, then, you're, then you'd probably say, this is a pretty relevant reference class. You mean the repeat teams. So you want to look at all the teams who did repeat? Well, we can't include New England in that category. That They wouldn't be a subset of that category because that hasn't happened yet. But maybe what you're thinking, David, is that you'd want to, maybe, maybe you independently look at teams that did um, repeat the, the Super Bowl that won twice in a row and look at what's true of them and then... Um, that could that whatever if there's some kind of common feature to that that then New England also shares then that would be a different reference class that we could have chosen instead like um, I don't know I don't like the New England Patriots at all but <laughs> it's like I love to say this but you know um, 
you might talk about the quality of their quarterback, let's say. <laughs> like the statistics of the quarterback of that Super Bowl winning team. Um, and maybe the teams that that have, you know, really highly performing quarterbacks do repeat. So the fact that New England is in the reference class of teams that have really high performing quarterbacks like Tom Brady, um, that that is an indicator that they would repeat as Super Bowl champions. So, so this is the kind of your that kind of thinking is what you need to do. So. Um, it might just be a matter of articulating it a little differently, David, but I think your intuition is barking up the right tree here, that the New England team ha is a member of so many different reference classes. There's a lot of things that are true of them that they might share with other past football teams, and maybe those features though, and that kind of class membership would be a better indicator of whether they're going to repeat as a Super Bowl champion. But I, this would be exactly the kind of problem I wouldn't put on the exam because evaluating this might require some background knowledge, <laughs> some background assumptions about football <laughs> um, or like what is relevant for being a competitive football team. I mean, you could probably come up with something to say here, even if you didn't know anything about sports and football and, and that kind of thing. But um, it would certainly help. I'm going to be avoiding problems like this. Uh, but does this make sense? Uh, sounds like you think so, David. How is everyone else in chat doing? Key thing here is with the second standard is recognizing that the reference class that was chosen, that you were given in the problem, you definitely need to think outside the box and try to imagine what other possible reference classes are uh, is the subset a member of, and would those be a better indicator for the claimed feature, whether or not they're going to repeat as Super Bowl champions, that kind of thing. Maybe their um, their record, right? Uh, how many wins and losses? Um, teams that did have this degree of winning did repeat, and so since New England has that degree of winning, then they're probably going to repeat too, or or something like that, right? Think you get it? Okay, cool. Um, we've got five more minutes. Um, anyone else want to throw something on our radar to take a look at? We'll be asking, I'll, I'll be giving you the opportunity to do this tomorrow again too, of course. Um, we can do some more review. I, I want to do more review with 8, 9, and 10 because there's a lot of tricky stuff going on, a lot of material here, lots of different standards to um, make sure you understand how to apply them. Um, but let's uh, let's see if we can't knock out a little bit more with the time we got left today. Anyone else got a problem for us to look at? Ooh, tough room this morning. <laughs> if, there, if there's just any way in which I can be helpful <laughs> and, and we can use the time productively right now, I want to do it. So don't be shy about asking for anything. I <laughs> think we're all half asleep. <laughs> Oh, by the way, code word for today is Pegasus. Um, so you want to you want to get that before I forget to give it to you. Pegasus is the code word. I will type it in here. There you go. Comparison between five and six from this exercise. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is a good one. Okay. So the reference class in both of these is stuff John says. Okay. Um, what's different is the subset. So in five, what John said 
is that his father is also named John. So the subset would be that moment when John said that his father is also named John. And in six, it's that the, when John said that the giants are going to win. So um, the reference class is just things John says, right? So, and, and the property in question is whether they're true. So if I'm trying to figure out whether John's father is named John is a true statement, is looking at the reference class of how this statement is in the category of stuff that John has said, uh, going to be a relevant reference class? I mean, the answer is basically, yeah. Uh, and why? Because of my background assumptions that John would be in a position to know what his father is named. So knowing that John generally says things that are true, like he's kind of like an honest dude, that does give me good reason to think that uh, that the reference class is a relevant one here for knowing, yeah, I can believe him when he says that, that John's father is named John. Now, when we're looking at whether the giants are going to win, looking at the reference class that this is a claim that's in the category of stuff John has said is not a very good indicator of figuring out whether this is true because it's not so much about John and his subjective honesty it's as much as whether John would be in a position to know this or not so the the reference class is way too general now if we had a reference class of John's prediction 98 percent of John's predictions about sporting events are true and then he said the Giants are going to win. And that would give me good reason to think the Giants are going to win. You know, if he if he has that kind of reliable track record on making predictions about sporting events, then that would be pretty impressive, right? Yeah, master sports analyst for sure. Um, but that, that's the thing that's contrasting between these two. The percentage is the same, right? So it's not like one of these is stronger or weaker based on the percentage. Um, it's all about the relevance of the reference class. And this reference class in 5 is pretty relevant. 6 is not. This is not going to be the best reference class for figuring out whether the Giants, it's true that the Giants are going to win. Does that make sense, David? And anybody? Yep, yep, cool, awesome. All right, well, it's uh, 11.20 right now, um, so that's our official close of class. Um, I do have this hour free between classes, so if people want to stick around and ask some more questions right now, you're very free to do that. Um, I'm probably going to stop the video right now, um, unless there's something something else someone wants to get in here right at the end. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll come back here tomorrow and do the same thing. Um, and uh, cover whatever problems you want to talk about or cover any material that you want to talk about. If you have questions about the exam, I can answer that. Basically, the rest of this week is all about preparing for the exam. And I believe I also um, mentioned that um, I'm carving out some space for tomorrow afternoon, kind of like the lab we do on Tuesdays. Um, I think I, I'm going to be able to be available tomorrow afternoon as well. Um, here, I just want to double check that and confirm it so I don't tell you the wrong thing here. Um, but uh, here, let me let me pull this up. Where is my weekend update email for critical reasoning? Do do. Here we go. Um, yeah, bonus lab from uh, 1:30 to 2:30 on Thursday. Um, that is that is going to happen. Um, so I'll keep the, just like we did yesterday, um, the link for coming to the lecture in the morning is the same link that will get you to this same chat room. I'll just be there later on in the day uh, to go over more stuff together. So that's also uh, available and out there for you. Yep. Okay. Anything else people want to ask about? You're welcome. Have a good day.
You bet. Absolutely, Dania. Have a good one.